Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, well, with that introduction, I don't really need to do anything else. I'll just have to introduce Andrea, so. Um, yeah, uh, I was here last year, so I was like all of you, and now I'm not. <laughs> I'm really happy, because <laughs> I get to rest. <laughs> um, but we have, a really great, uh, we have a really great night tonight. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Andrea Tyne's work, but I'm sure that those of you who are here today for Type Paris got to experience the critique, Andrea. So Andrea Tinez is from Germany. She is a Berlin graphic designer, typographer du jour. And uh, she has her own label. It's very infamous. It's Type Cuts. Yes. So um, I had the pleasure of being able to look through all of her work and research her a little bit over the past couple weeks and uh, really impressed and in love with so much of the color and the feeling and the emphasis of um, typography and the way that you use it is so interesting and different. Um, you know, you had devoted quite a bit of your career over 20 years to right. just typography, no? Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, and you just finished up uh, an exhibit, The Lettering Shapes from A to Z at Berlin. Right. Yes. Right. Um, I don't know if any of you were able to go see that, but it was probably amazing. I wish I would have been able <laughs> to be there. Um, but your biggest goals, I would say, are to inspire those, to inspire students, especially all of you here. And uh, I think that you'll be pretty fascinated by some of the things that you'll be seeing today, as well as some of her background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I think with that, I will leave it to you. Okay. So, um, <laughs> bonsoir et merci pour cette introduction. <laughs> These are the only French words you're going to <laughs> get from me tonight. But again, in English, many thanks, Christine, for this wonderful introduction. Many thanks, Jean-Francois, um, for having me here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure today, although it was really hot <laughs> up on the fifth floor, to look at all these really interesting approaches uh, of the students of Type Paris um, in terms of type design really had a lot of fun looking at all the work. And I'm going to start right now. And of course, okay, I have this really long password. <laughs> all right, <laughs> it worked. So this is obligatory. Okay, so I think it's done. <laughs> okay, here we go. So the Library of Shapes, Text and Structures, that's the title of an ongoing project and also the title of the exhibition Christine was referring to. So I only brought you one project tonight, this project, and from this project I brought you one typeface the so-called A Fish Collection. It's still a working title because I might have to change the name. But I felt instead of um, having this kind of portfolio show where I go from work to work and another work, it's probably, especially for the students, a lot more interesting to take you, to take you through the process of an entire typeface to see what got me inspired, you know, what are the kind of details and all the different directions. Maybe it's inspirational for you also for your own typographic work. So, um, yes, I recently had my first ever solo exhibition, which was really an honor. Uh, thanks to Anja Lutz, she's a book designer, but also a curator and an author. And she opened up this new space called A to Z in Berlin. It's a space which is going to show graphic design work, experimental approaches in graphic design for the next uh, two years. Uh, I think also Pierre Di Giulio is going to be there. And also I, I think Fanette Mellier, both of them are from France. Uh, so I was really happy to show my work there. So what you see within this exhibition, this is in front, that's actually the library. So the library is a real library. It's my personal archive of shapes and graphic elements and structures and texts, and also two 
typefaces. Uh, what you see around this library are two big poster walls, and the poster walls, you know, the posters are making use of this library, and it's a little bit like celebrating the typefaces and printing them with fluorescent colors and experimenting with them. It's a little bit like a three-dimensional type specimen celebrating the type in sort of a kind of Wunderkammer. It's a German term. So, but getting back to the library itself. Um, as a library, there are several sections. Um, there's one section called shapes. Then there's one section called typefaces, which is part, is like a subcategory of the shapes. Then there's a category called structures, and then there's a category called text. And because this is kind of abstract, I'm going to show you quickly how the folders are going, you know, how they actually look like. Altogether, there are about 45 folders. Each folder has between 100 and uh, 200 pages. So altogether, the library consists of almost four four, more than almost 5,000 pages. Uh, and to take you um, with me through the kind of categories, you know, when you know we have the three categories: shapes, text, and structures. And when you go to shapes, there are also subcategories. You know, the shapes are categorized into circular shapes, triangular shapes, like bitmaps, lines and stripes, crisscrosses, crisscrosses, polygons, hybrids, ornaments, and so on. And the structures, there are like categories like bitmaps, like uh, gradients and halftones, lines and stripes, noise, glitch, typographic, and so on. So starting with the shape folders. So this, these are some examples showing you circular shapes, pixelated shapes, or these are ornamental shapes or hybrid shapes. And the interesting thing about it is these are all fonts. So I archive all my shapes into the format of a font file. And this is really, you know, really, uh, this comes really handy. If you have the shapes, uh, you, you know, archived within a font file, you can always use them. I mean, you can just, just install the font and you have the shapes always available within your uh, design programs like InDesign or Illustrator. So it's a much better way to store graphic elements than having them distributed over many different files on your desktop. So, you know, I have about 50 fonts or so within this library of shapes, and um, in this library I show the different fonts, you know, it's like A, B, C, D, and so on. But I also, I play with the shapes, you know, uh, I have some compositions or, you know, I use the shapes with a kind of structures. So if I take out one of the folders, you know, I have the fonts and the shapes and everything together and I know where to find them. So these are some spreads from the structure folders and as you can see, there are like bitmap structures, there are like geometric structures, there are some glitches. Uh, and some scan experiments. Furthermore, you find like painted structures, uh, like organic structures, like half tones and gradients and noise, noise and some painted patterns. And even more structures, these are kind of hybrid structures, these are kind of collage uh, combined with photographic images and also with kind of geometric structures. Uh, this is an example for typographic structures. Uh, as many typographers and type designers, I like to take pictures within the city and I especially like to take pictures from poster walls, vanished posters. And if you turn them into these black and white images, they really create their own poetry and they're really kind of special character, almost like paintings. So library of shapes, tags, and structures. There are, of course, also tags. I have a kind of diary, I, uh, uh, like a text log. So everything I'm reading online or newspapers or book, books, any kind of sentences or quotes which I think are inspiring or which I like, I just write down in this kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a text file, and you know, I order them. 
And uh, this is, you know, with this I try to find also inspiration for my work, but also inspiration for the assignments and projects with the students. And as you can see, there are some typefaces used really big over there. And that's because the library also consists of two typefaces. One of the typefaces, which I only shortly present, it's called Allgemein Grotesque. It's a re revision of one of my older typefaces, which was called Wedding Sense. The basic idea is that this grotesque typeface mixes round and square letter forms um, via open type features. Uh, without any open type feature activated, it's more like a generic grotesque typeface. But the interesting thing is the more uh, stylistic set you activate, the typeface get more and more square, so it adds a little bit more idiosyncrasy and a little bit more character to the typeface. It's a little bit like you were uh, mixing accidents, grotesque, and Euro style. So that's the kind of feeling you get when you're using this typeface with all the features. But I'm not gonna talk about this typeface tonight. The typeface I'm going to talk uh, a little bit longer tonight, it's called Affiche. Uh, well, you know, French word for posters. Uh, it's a cat's only headline typeface with three width, three cents serif, uh, three cents version, three serif versions, and uh, it's a display typeface which I created as my own personal tool, my own, own personal instrument. So this is going to be the talk now. It's really about the development of this typeface. Uh, I'm going to talk about my motivation, what got me started with this typeface. I will show you a lot of research and a lot of inspirations, a lot of references and a little bit of analysis. So I'm going to take you on a typographic journey. Like four years ago, our school where I teach, the Burg Giebichenstein, University of Art and Design, was celebrating its 100th anniversary. And uh, it's a little bit uh, a joke at our school. We were before the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus is celebrating now its 100th uh, anniversary, but we were a little bit earlier as they are. But I also tell this because, you know, uh, we are very close, like Dessau and Weimar, where the Bauhaus was situated. It's, very, it's a very close distance to my school, and actually some of the teachers, you know, at my school back then, 100 years ago, uh, they came from, you know, from the Bauhaus. So um, when we were celebrating our 100th anniversary, um, we had an exhibition um, where all the teachers from my school were showing their work. So everybody of us was assigned a wall, and on this wall we were showing our work. And I was showing the so-called abecedarium. It was trying to show elements of my typographic work and type design work from A to Z. So uh, you could see initial caps, you could see some of my alphabets, but you could also see some of my typefaces in use. I was using quotes from Sister Corita Kent. I'm a big fan of her. If you don't know Sister Corita Kent, she was a nun who was uh, practicing in the 60s and uh, 50s and 60s in Los Angeles, and she did some really amazing work. Um, okay, and while working all this on, on these different pieces, I noticed and I realized I don't have a very good display typeface. Most of my typefaces, you know, they are not very compact. They don't really work well in posters. So after the exhibition, I made a short brief for myself, you know. I really want to have a display typeface, and this display typeface, you know, it should be, you know, should have various width, condensed, narrow, and normal. I only want to use uppercase letter. It should be a pure cap typeface and these different width, they could be distributed over caps, lowercase and small caps positions. I might want to have various diets like sans serif variants or serif variants, so I could mix both of the, dif or, or the different diets. Then I'm really interested in, in uh, an reverse italics. So my brief also contained, you know, like, 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 you know, I would like to have italics, reverse italics, and maybe even different angles, various weights, black, bold, regular, light. 
I'm also a big fan for alternate characters. So I was wondering, okay, if this is my typeface, my instrument, I also want to have a lot of stylistic sets. I want to have many symbols. I want to have flat accents so I can stack the typeface. And I also want to have maybe light punctuation. And because this typeface what was meant to use in posters and in big sizes, I called it Affiche Collection. It's still a working title. Uh, when I came up with this brief and with this name in 2015, 2016, I researched all the different libraries like FontShop, MyFonts, and so, and there wasn't a typeface yet called a fish. In the meantime, there is one, and there are. So um, I have to, although I really, really have a hard time giving up that name, I might have to give up that name. But for now, you know, it's the a fish collection. So, and what you should do, if you have a design brief and you think, you know, you know, these are the kind of design characteristics I'm interested in, you have to research the field. You have to have a look what's already out there in typefaces. So I looked around, and as you can see here, Jean-Francois Fauché, Anisette, typeface from uh, the 90s, and he's exactly doing this, you know. He has a typeface, uppercase, various widths, so I felt, Hmm, it's already been done. Okay, and I looked even more. Back around this time, a new typeface was published um, from Peter Bielak. It was a, a, a corporate uh, typeface for the new school in New York, commissioned by Paula Scher. And it was also a typeface, only uppercase, various width. Um, okay, it's also done there. So another typeface uh, which uses various width, very, very popular, it's Druk by uh, Berton Hasebe. I don't know if I pronounce his name correctly. Although with this typeface, with Druk, it's all different fonts, whereas in this typeface, all the different widths are stored within one font. Okay, and I also looked at uh, posters and you know various uh, uh, typographic interpretations, and I felt, Huh, maybe various with um, it's been done, and uh, it's a big question: Do I want to proceed, or do I find, or do I want to find my own sort of interpretation? Maybe there's a niche I can find, you know, still following this idea. And I also looked at reverse italics. You know, there's this really interesting um, project um, commer from commercial type. It's called Kathleen Doric. Um, they designed this typeface uh, with various lens and various italics for the Istanbul Biennale a while ago. And then there's from Heffler & Co, there's Turbo and Nitro. Uh, it's a corporate uh, typeface for the New York football team Jets, I think. Okay. So with this all in mind, I felt, okay, there are quite a few typefaces doing what I want to do. How can I do something different? Okay, so I went back in history. I looked at a lot of history books, a lot of type design catalogs, a lot of specimens to see, you know, what can I find, you know, back in history. So one of the books, it's not necessarily history or it's recent history. I don't know if you know this book. It's uh, called In the Good Name of the Company. It's co-authored by Brian Rettinger. And this book shows you the posters of the Colby Printing Company uh, in Los Angeles. The Colby Printing Company existed from the end of the 40s till 2012 when they had to close their doors. What's really interesting about these posters, they are, you know, letterpress, wooden and metal letters, uh, fluorescent uh, day glow colors. They use various typefaces within one posters. And I was always intrigued, you know, how the different typefaces really sort of are coherent and uh, how they are consistent and how they create an interesting pattern on the page. And also, you see different widths. And what I also found very intriguing is you have different terminal cuts. If you look, for example, here at the S, it's a diagonal cut. If you look, for example, here at the three, it's a vertical cut. And if you look at the three here, it's a horizontal cut. And so you have very, you have these different approaches that nevertheless, they mix pretty well on the page. And this is something I was very interested in. If I'm going to design my typeface, maybe I can mix those different terminal cuts. 
So, and uh, maybe referring today to the various crits we have, um, you know, what about irregularities within a typeface and what about inconsistencies or consistencies within a typeface? Uh, if I remember back when I was a student, I went to grad school and my teacher was Jeffrey Keady. I remember he used to say, keep the inconsistencies consistent. And while I was researching, you know, for the Affiche collection, I found this quote from Ed Feller, also from CalArts, keep the ir irregularities inconsistent. So that's the big question, you know, when designing a typeface. And I like to refer actually to Jeff Keady, keep the inconsistencies consistent. But to what degree? How much inconsistency inconsistencies can you have within a typeface? I mean, that's usually the big challenge when you're designing typeface. How normal, how idiosyncratic, and what's the kind of, you know, place in between you find for yourself to have your typeface original, but maybe not too weird. So, but what I really like about the work of Ed Feller, it's very, very idiosyncratic. And what I really like about, you know, especially this work, if you look at the various letters, if you especially look at the E, you know, same width here and there, all of a sudden it gets a little bit wider, it gets even more wide, it gets a little bit smaller. So you have various widths uh, mixed uh, here, and it still works. I mean, it still, it really creates an interesting texture. It's a little bit off, but it's still working. And when I saw this work from Ed again, I felt, you know, this is a kind of um, maybe a direction I want to go into. I don't want to have uh, extreme width differences, like very narrow, very wide, but maybe within a certain kind of range. And that might be quite interesting because I might be able to achieve this kind of pattern, this kind of texture. Okay, and I looked at some of my uh, pictures from my vacation in Spain, and this is also this kind of vernacular uh, type, which I think is really intriguing. If you look at the A, the A is a little bit more white, a little bit more smaller, or the P is white, but the D and the R are a little bit shorter, uh, smaller in width. And I think this is really interesting. It still works because it all has the same design. So this is fascinating for me. How can you incorporate like irregularities and still make them work? Or even this is a little bit more bizarre. It's also from my vacation in Spain. You know, you see different width of, of an A. They're all a little bit different, but they're still working. Okay, but I also traveled really back in history. Uh, I looked at several type catalogs from the 19th century, and this is a source I can really recommend you. It's a, it's a museum of wood types and ornaments. I don't know if you know this collection. It's a big collection of uh, specimen catalogs, uh, which you nowadays, that which are really hard to find. They show a lot of the pages in high resolution. So if you're looking for very interesting display typefaces and wood type from the 19th century, that might be a place to go. So I found the Hamilton wood type catalog and I looked at the pages and I found very interesting uh, typefaces and models of typefaces like the Devine typeface or various Latin typefaces or modern typefaces. Uh, or this kind of painter's Roman style with a kind of convex and really sort of interesting uh, 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 series. I just, you know, recall, you know, we had a grid today with one of the students who actually used this kind of um, kind of forms within her typeface. Where is she? There she is, exactly. Maybe this might be also inspirational for you to go back in history and look at painter's Roman again. And also, uh, reversed italics. Reversed italics are quite fascinating. And while I was researching reversed italic, I found this really interesting talk by Joe de Burdemaker. He was giving this talk at A Type Pi in 2016. And uh, he, he showed a lot of interesting examples. And he really pointed out, like in the 19th century, when you only had black and white posters, you know, one one method to sort of make a difference between the different informations was actually to introduce a reversed italic typeface. 
And he also showed other examples. I don't know if you know this book. It's a, um, it's a spread for Mira Calligraphie Monumenta. It's one of the most beautiful books in the world, I think. It's from, the, um, it's from Georg Boxkai. Whenever you get a hand on this book, but also, um, if you go to the Getty collection, you can find all the spreads from the Mira Calligraphie Monumenta in high resolution to really look at this really beautiful lettering. Okay, that's a little bit for the historical research. Now we're getting to the sketches. So these are the kind of sketches I usually do, like very, very tiny little drawings. So it's more a little bit like, you know, um, reminding me what to do. So when I started to sketch, I used these keys, letter these key letter forms. Uh, I looked at the H, the E, the O, the S, the R, and the P. That gives me enough information about the character of the typeface. I explored various widths, and the first uh, sketches were, you know, researching this kind of convex serifs. Then I got into the kind of modern style, you know, working with high contrast. Uh, but when I looked at this, uh, this has been done so much, so you know maybe this is not the kind of direction I want to take for the typeface. I looked at stencil forms, so you know, you know, moving uh, from uh, the high contrast uh, forms. I looked at high contrast uh, uh, stencil forms and low contrast stencil forms. You know, several directions. But in the end, uh, after many sketches, I mean, this is just a part of it. I ended up with these three different models and these three different approaches, like the Latin model, the Romana model, and the stencil model. And what I mean by that, going back to my type catalogs again, you see you know, all these post-its over there. I was really looking at a lot of pages. So for the so-called Latin style, you have these really sharp triangular serifs. And these serifs are really, really big and blocky. And some of these styles even use reverse contrast. And I also looked at some digital interpretations like uh, Latin compress or Latin extra condensed, but also other typefaces which are using triangular serifs, like for example, Matrix from Susanna Litschko or Portrait from Burton Hesebe again, which is a really beautiful interpretation of a Renaissance typeface, but with triangular serifs. And as for the Romana model, um, I was looking again at Devine. Devine is also a beautiful typeface uh, designed at the end of the 19th century by Gustav Schröder and expanded by Nicolas Werner for the Central Type Foundry. And this typeface got really popular at the end of the 19th century, and it was copied from many different type foundries. And I think the style you call in French is Elsevier, and in German it's also called Römische. And here are a few more examples, uh, also with a condensed version of Romana. And also this is again a picture from my vacation in Spain. Uh, I found these really beautiful tiles you use, or you know, maybe Gina knows maybe a little bit more about it, for your address or for your house. And you can also see, especially you know, with the R and the C, it's this kind of Romana model. Um, it's a little bit uh, chunky and a little bit awkward, but still, it, ha it has a lot of character. So, and I also looked at several digital interpretations, like Hawthorne from Mike Danes, or Denver, or Romana Bold, or ITC Bernas. And actually, uh, the last couple of years, there were some interesting uh, um, releases of uh, uh, typefaces with this kind of Romana model. There's uh, um, Rando from Maurice Göldner from Camelot typefaces, and there's uh, Roslindale by Jonathan, Jonathan Ross. There's a middle name, Jonathan. I think Jonathan Roth, exactly. So, and I also looked at some stencil forms to see how I can inter inter interpret the kind of stencil forms. I mean, there are some really beautiful uh, stencil letter forms. Okay, so, so much for inspiration and research. Now we're getting to the typefaces. So I decided, you know, for the Affiche collection, the serif version is going to have three 
different version. It's going to be the Latin version with this really sharp triangular serifs. It's going to be the Romana model, which is a lot more smooth and a little bit organic, and there's going to be a stencil version. The Latin version has contrast, but the Romana version has more contrast, and the uh, stencil version has the same contrast as the Romana version, but has a little bit, the serifs are a little bit more triangular. So this is a set of three versions. So here you can have a look into the different letter forms. And you know, while working with the serifs, I came up, you know, with the kind of idea to also use this kind of sharp sharpness, you know, with certain letters like the R and the K. And this was actually a good decision because it also helped me with the other typefaces. So they uh, work together as a family. So yesterday I saw how Jean-Francois was talking about figures. So you see this figure set with the serifs on top, but if you go to the Romana model, if you know you go back and forth, you see a different kind of way how to design the figures. And if you go back and forth again, you know, everything is a little bit more smooth. Also this area here is a little bit more smooth. This is kind of sharp. This is a little bit smooth again. And last but not least, this is the stencil model. Uh, and with the stencil, you know, I have again these certain characteristic, but I decided to have this kind of asymmetrical uh, cuts. So which first I wasn't really sure if this is going to work, but then if I look at it, it really creates this really interesting white spaces between, you know, the different stems. So, and here you can see, you know, a comparison of the different letter forms. And now I'm getting into the different width because this uh, was my aim all along to have a typeface which has different width from narrow or condensed, narrow and normal. So I really, really um, experimented or really explored how the different widths are going to work together, how extreme can they be. And in the end, I decided not to go too extreme. Um, there's also a reason for that, you know, it's, uh, it's if you have a condensed typeface and a white typeface and they have the same uh, weight, you know, the condensed typeface always looks bolder than the uh, wider typeface. And it was really, I was really juggling a lot to get the sort of weight right so they look the same when you use them within a typeface. And next to these three weights, which are distributed over uppercase, lowercase, and small caps, there are also alternate forms, like really round forms, uh, which you can activate through stylistic set. So here you can see, you know, the different steps within the different weights. And here you can see the different steps between the sans serif weight. And this is what I'm going to show you now. I decided to have three different sense version, you know, horizontal cut. You remember Colby printing the different posters, horizontal terminal cuts, diagonal horizontal cuts, and vertical horizontal cuts. It's a little bit like antique olive kind of flavor. And I also decided with these uh, one with the, verti with, the uh, with the horizontal cuts, they're going to be a little bit more straight. So here you don't have a curve, it's a straight line. But the other two versions, you have a slight curve, so there's a little bit more tension in there. So these are some char char characteristic characters, sounds a little bit weird. Uh, to get you an idea of the typeface. Uh, and here you see again how I carved into the R. It's kind of the same idea I did with the serif typefaces. And here you have the version with the diagonal cuts. I mean, if anybody has an idea about a name, so far it's grotesque H for horizontal, <laughs> grotesque D for diagonal cuts, and grotesque V for vertical, it's, it's, it's not very interesting, but I couldn't come with any different names so far. So here you have a view to the, uh, to the vertical cuts. So here there's a comparison with the different letter forms, and here you see again the different width, 
And again, you know, this is the round form as an alternative character. And here again, you see the different width all together. Okay, so having different width within one typeface, uh, as you can see, this was total kerning nightmare because the idea is that you can use the weights all together. So you don't use only um, the, the uppercase together or the lowercase together or the small caps together. No, you should use every, every weight, you know, uppercase, lowercase, and small caps together. But also this also, this means they have to be kerned. And you don't, you, you're not, you, well, you can't put them into kerning classes because the angles and the, the round, the, the curves are different. So they have to be kerned a lot. So I uh, made my this text document, you know, I'm still working with FontLab and this is how I did it. You know, I have this huge string of kerning characters, which I went through the typeface again and again and again and again to really kern. And this was really, really, you know, this was actually uh, the moment when I wanted to give up, which was just really boring. Okay, so, but you know, something more fun. <laughs> alternate characters. I really love alternate characters because, you know, when I'm designing a typeface, I'm designing it with the spirit of a typographer and a graphic designer. And as a graphic designer, I really li like to, you know, maybe to switch characters to see, you know, this R looks really different than this R within your design. And this is really sort of special. And sometimes, you know, this is a little bit too special and you don't want to use it again. So um, with the uh, fish collection, I decided I'm going to use all 20 different stylistic character sets. And I think maybe if I was a foundry who wants to sell typefaces, I mean, maybe that's necessarily, that's not the way to do it because no one will ever find all these stylistic sets. Okay, so stylistic set one, round forms. So if you activate stylistic set one, you get all these different round forms. The same with the sans serif versions. And you know, other character, uh, characters like the eye, you know, with the, with the uh, stylistic set activated, the series become more and more uh, longer. Or, uh, you know, this is the normal M, but the stylistic alternate, you know, it goes right to the baseline and so on. You know, you see there are different versions, and depending how you switch them, it's going to have a different, you know, uh, feel and look to your typography. Oh, and again here, that's the K. If you're sick of this uh, particular element, you know, you can choose this K. Same with the R. Uh, and here again, there's also two different K versions, and there's a different R, and you have a different N. Same with figures. Of course, you have to have a figure, you know, the, the zero has to have a slash, and there's a round zero. And I'm a big fan of this closed two. I don't know if you met Ferdinand Ulrich before. He's the assistant of Eric Spiegerman. He collects this kind of closed uh, two shapes. Uh, and I really like them a lot. I have different ampersands, you know, and so on. And I really love punctuation. Like, uh, as a typographer, I really like to have a light punctuation in my type settings because it really gives uh, a little bit more elegance. And as for diacritical marks, these are the German umlauts. Um, and if you want to use your typeface within a poster, you really want to have the line spacing very tight. So it really helps, you know, to have these umlauts uh, underneath, you know, the cap height so you can stack your typefaces. So here we are, so 20 stylistic character sets. I think that's what InDesign <laughs> allows you to use, and I used them all. <laughs> and of course, that's, there's not only the alphabet, punctuation, there's also different, um, wow, this is going to be heavy, different, different characters, like for example, the interior bang, or you have the pound, or fractions, or the omega. What I'm not showing is um, I also introduced the capital uh, German S also, it's not here, then there are some figures, and I really wanted to show you this, you know, there are different variations of a three, but they all didn't make it into the typeface. I mean, this is usually the process, what you're doing, wha what you're seeing right now, these are the final versions, but before you come to the final versions, 
you're going through a lot of variations, uh, you know, with your characters, and you, you know, you explore and you test, and you feel in the end, you know, they might not working with your typeface. Okay, and I'm a big fan of ornaments and patterns. Of course, you know, they have to be arrows and the kind of ornament stuff with both versions, and you can put them into patterns and borders and everything. And uh, because I want to use the typeface very big and I want to stack it, so I use these very flat accent, accents and diacritical marks, but I still kind of feel they are not uh, small enough, they are not light enough, and uh, I'm a little bit reluctant going back and changing them, but <laughs> eventually I might do, because I think they're still too big. Okay, so now uh, the typefaces uh, are existing only in one weight, like the sans-serif version has a black weight, and the serif versions, they have a bold weight, but I'm still considering to add another weight like a more regular or more lightweight, because I think it gives you a little bit more freedom and a, a little bit more possibilities if you want to use the typeface. Reverse italic, so, <laughs> woo! <laughs> so this is really what I wanted to do, to have reverse italic, you know, like makes your typeface dance, and to have different angles. So, so the extreme angle is, uh, is 12 degrees, and I also felt, you know, it could be nice to have like 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 six degree in between, and also here uh, dancing <laughs> italics. But in the end, I decided against uh, against the the six six angle degree because it was not only too much work. When I used the typeface, I felt it's not enough difference. It, it's more interesting if you have you know you have the the the, the upright version. You have the italic and the reverse italic. It creates enough pattern and enough texture, and you know it's enough. Okay, so we almost at the end. Uh, so the typeface in use. So this a fish caps only headline typeface with the with the services <laughs> sans versions. This is when you set the typeface only in uppercase letters. You know it looks like quite like a normal typeface. This is when you introduce, you know, you remember um, the piece I showed you from Ed Feller. It's starting to get a little bit more awkward and a little bit more weird, but it's still, it's, it's working with the different width and the different, you know, kind of alternate character sets. And this is, you know, when you introduce the round forms. And this is when you introduce the italic and the reverse italic. So with this kind of features, you have enough actually possibilities to design posters and to really work with the different different character width and the different angles. Okay, the same for the sans serif typeface. And actually, if you really look closely, I'm mixing the different uh, terminal cuts and they really work well. Okay, again here, you know, the different width. And here you have the italics and reverse italics. Okay, so I'm quickly going through the alphabet. This is, uh, these are the, this is the alphabet on the lowercase positions. Here we have uppercase and small caps positions. This is the italic. And this is the reverse italic. The same with the sans serif version, lowercase positions uppercase and small caps positions, the italic and the reverse italic. And this is the entire character set. So of course, you know, it's a Latin extended character set, which you have to do and you see, you know, everything all together. Okay, so back again to the beginning of the talk, you know, I uh, told my, my husband, you know, there's going to be a lot of color at the beginning, a lot of color at the end, and in between it's all black and white because that's type design. Uh, so back again at the exhibition. So this is, you know, how you put the typeface into use. And to end this talk, I'm going to show you the posters, kind of like specimen posters uh, with the different colors. And I think that shows you how important it is to use your type designs within the typographic work because that's how type you know, becomes alive. 
and especially with the colors. I mean, I was really fortunate to be able to print these posters within these fluorescent colors at our printer's shop uh, at our university. There's a big thank you to the printer, Matthias Schwenke, who printed all the poster with me assisting him. So there's another version uh, of the posters. And you can see, you know, it's, a, it's the same design, but once you're starting using color, you know, uh, what, what, different, what difference it makes. Okay, and here again, specimen poster with different colors. And also, I think the process of overprinting is really interesting, and it adds another character to the different posters. And here again, another version of the posters. And here we are. <laughs> I'm finished, and so I'm ready and happy to take questions from the audience. Thank you so much for <laughs> listening. That was incredible. Yeah. I have to apologize, actually, for my English tonight. I'm, uh, I was speaking the entire day, so tonight, you know, the heavy German accent really came through. <laughs> That's okay. My German's awful. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, 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 we're equal. <laughs> um, I'm really curious, actually, to go back a little bit about when you referenced um, Sister Mary Corita Kent. Yes, yeah, yeah, you know so her. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm familiar with her work. Yeah. Uh, the okay. To go over here, apparently. So, yes, <laughs> like I was saying, uh, the color palettes. Yeah. Do you feel like that was wh what was the inspiration when you saw her? When did when did you discover her? And well, I discovered Sister Corita when I was in LA. Yeah. I made my master at uh, Cal Arts, and you know, in LA, everybody knows Sister Corita. Ken. Exactly. So uh, within our curriculum, when we were talking about design history, Sister Corita, she was a name which uh, her, her name popped up quite often. But it's not only because of her work, which is really postmodern, right. although it was done in the 50s and 60s, I think it's also her teaching approach. I think, uh, you, you know, she has this kind of teaching manifesto, um, like 10 rules for student, uh, students and teachers. And I think it's just, uh, it, it's, 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 these are rules which really engage with the students. We really, you know, put the students first and really want to work with the students and encourage them to explore, to make experiments, and to make mistakes. I'm noticing that you like rules, yeah. and yeah. you're very, <laughs> you know, pragmatic yeah. with your approach. Yeah. Where do you find the emotion coming in? Like, what what is emotional to you when you when you're designing? Mm, okay. Well, there, there, I think there are different answers. You know, the emotion is, mm, of course, color. Mm -hmm. Color brings in emotion, but I think also complexity, maybe, yeah. the kind of layering and everything. But of course, also, it's the content. I mean, this is purely form, you know. Yeah. This is no content in the sense, you know, it's not, you know, communicating any message. So the emotion usually comes, of course, with your text and your message, Yeah. of course. I, out of curiosity, how long did it take you to create that library? And, and following that, yeah. are you going to continue to? Yes, well, actually, that's actually the aim is to continue. That's the idea of the folders yeah. and the library is going to grow. Yeah, it looks like there was yeah. some empty slots in there. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was like, oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to keep going for a long yes, time. Yes, yeah, that's <laughs> the idea. Well, yeah. I started with the uh, fish collection at the beginning of 2016. And then a little bit later, also the idea of the library yeah. came up. And also, at the same time, I went back to revise uh, my typeface Wedding Sense, calling yeah. now Allgemein Grotesque. So it's a, it's a, yeah, the, the last three and a half years I've been working on this. Yeah, yeah. and do you find that you're getting bored of it at all? Or are you getting frustrated by it? Or do you uh, love it? Curious. Mm, actually, you know, when I uh, was working, um, you know, when I was designing these posters, I really felt that, you know, these posters, they are making use of the library. You know, the library as my personal yeah. toolkit uh, of graphic elements. I really enjoyed uh, using them, and I'm actually not bored yet. I mean, the idea is, you know, this is now presenting the typeface, but in here, I have a lot of texts I would like to work with, 
And yeah. there are so much more elements I would like to put into use. I think, you know, it's a, it's a lifetime project. Yeah, it yeah. seems so. And especially uh, taking your thoughts out of context yeah. and then putting them and, you know, categorizing them. What made you decide to do that? Like what was it? What was the impetus that you were like? Yeah. I need to keep these. I need to categorize them. Yeah. I need to keep a catalog in order to remember yeah. or to use them in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think many people are surprised. Um, they think I'm very precise and you know I clean up my space and everything. I'm very organized, yeah. but I'm actually not. <laughs> <laughs> I really have a hard time organizing my things. And if you look at my desktop, I cleaned it up for tonight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but usually my desktop is filled with folders and, and stuff. And I felt, you know, for the library, I really need to find a system for myself yeah. to categorize everything so I'm able to find it again. Yeah. Because, you know, categorizing means, archiving means to know where to find it. And so that was actually the reason to do it that way, to find categories which are understandable and categories which, you know, are descriptive enough so I know what's in this category. Yeah. So it's an engineer's mindset, yeah, very probably. typographic driven. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was like, oh my yeah. gosh. But it's a help because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really messy. It's yeah. really a help for me. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to open it up to the audience to see if you guys had some questions for Andrea, which I know you do. And if you don't, I have a million more. <laughs> yes. Hello. So first of all, congratulations for the talk. So far, for me, one of the best. Uh, if you remember this so morning, much? Uh, yes. We were talking about skipping uh, type design decisions mm -hmm. and hiding them. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in I, in you know, in I, was, I, was, yeah. I was warning you about yeah, yeah. <laughs> stylistic yeah. sets. Yeah, so we were talking about hiding type design decisions under stylistic yeah. sets and alternates yeah. because yeah. then you don't take a decisions yeah. and everyone is happy. So, so as you said, yeah, this is a, a, a debate here in in the type design industry. So my, right. my question is, how do you feel about this? Obviously, in this project has sense, like yeah. this was your main idea, like, uh, but how do you feel about in other situations about this? Well, for me, it's a, it's a selfish decision. You know, I designed the typeface for myself and I want to have these uh, possibilities. I want to be able to select. But of course, from a, uh, I think from a seller's point of view, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into, you know, the designing of alternate characters. And, you know, it's a, it takes a lot of work. So it's really a question if you want to do it, because a lot of graphic designers and uh, typographers, they even don't know how to find stylistic sets. And it's, you know, it's, it's a work which you don't necessarily know if it's going to be used. Okay, then second, I think it's perfectly right to say, you know, if you don't, if you are not able to make decision, oh, I'm going to have an alternate characters. It's a little bit like, you know, um, avoiding the problem to make, to take a decision for a typeface because the, the way you design re uh, like key characters, it really defines the appearance, the look and feel of your typeface. And if you decide, okay, mm, I can't decide, you know, you're not maybe rigid enough. So um, I totally understand to say, you know, if it, it's, it's avoiding, you know, taking decisions. Thank you. Okay. Are you going to extend beyond those three and beyond all? I mean, you did a lot already, but yeah. are you, are you going to extend them further? Well, I'm currently working um, on this typeface Allgemein Grotesque. It's uh, currently, uh, um, Allgemein uh, means actually generic. <laughs> it's a German word because I Love think it. it's <laughs> first of all, the typeface appears generic and the more stylistic sets, the more square characters you activate, the more weird it becomes yeah. and I'm currently I have uh, five weights and I'm working on the italics but I still want to expand it and I have a monospace version and I want to expand it into um, also a condensed version nice. so it's an you know it's a, it's kind of a thing actually all my typefaces they are perpetual beta they are not published and I don't know when to publish them or I even don't know if I want to publish them yeah. because I'm a, 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 a you know like a uh, 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 you know, I'm teaching 
and I have my studio and I'm designing the typeface, but to run a type foundry, to take care of all the marketing, social media, and the mastering of the typefaces. So another full-time job. It's, uh, <laughs> I have to, you know, I have to be two persons to do that. Yeah, exactly. So I'm actually stuck with these typefaces a little bit. Right now, they are my typefaces. I'm using them. Yeah. Don't know what to do with them in the future. If I'm going to publish them, or if a type foundry is going to publish them, I, think I don't know. a lot know. of people here would like to use them. <laughs> I <don't> <laughs> Me included. <laughs> um, yeah, who else yeah. has a question? Yes. Um, it's uh, since long time that you teach yeah. in various school. Mm -hmm. um, does the way you teach or the fact to teach have an influence on your career or the way you design typeface or your practice as a graphic designer? Or, or one influence the other on both sides? They influence each other all the, the time. Are you able yeah. to continue to be a um, professional without to, to teach? Well, actually, I'm uh, uh, in Germany. Uh, being a full-time professor means I'm employed by the state. <laughs> it happened, uh, you know, I've been teaching at the school 12 years ago, and uh, six years ago, I received tenure. I think that's the term. Yeah, congratulations. So I'm going to be there the rest of my life if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> you can die there. Till I'm 67. <laughs> so, but it's uh, you know it's it's being safe, but it's also I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy teaching uh, typography and type design, but I'm often also a little bit sad that I don't have enough time, you know, doing uh, my type design and typographic work. I'm actually I have a hard time taking clients because teaching. And also, not only teaching, you know, the, all the bureaucratic organizational stuff at school takes a lot of our, our time because, you know, for clients, I wouldn't be, you know, what, what's the correct term for that? They couldn't rely on me to be in time or on time because uh, I have so many commitments at school. But the way the students work, the way, um, you know, the way I engage with them, it's really inspirational for me. Usually when I get home from teaching, I think, oh, I want to I wanna design myself. I want to do this, <laughs> and I want to do this. And uh, you know, it's not being jealous, but a little bit, because they can do it, yeah. and I can't do. So, but I'm usually really, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the semester break in winter and in summer when I have more time again to, to design. Yeah, uh, you do like self-initiated uh, projects, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. continuous, yeah, no? Yeah, yeah. That's con I mean, that's the only way to do it because, you know, of the problem right. taking clients. So right. It's all and do you, do you find that, do you sell the work ever? Well, the, uh, um, um, the gallery wanted to sell the posters, and I was really reluctant because many of them, there's only one poster. Because you know, when we were printing them, um, I had a setup. I knew it's it's almost like a like a like like a screenplay. I uh. knew I wanted to um, combine these and these and these and these shapes. Mm -hmm. But but wha when we were printing, I felt, oh, Matthias, let's uh, let's go and uh, combine this, or let's go and combine this with this color. And sometimes there were just only one version because this was really spontaneous. So they're more like thing. works of art. Yeah. Yeah, but we were selling some of them. There are some of them, there are like, you know, there's an edition, there's like five or 10 of them, mm -hmm. and these we were selling. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. but the one where I have only one poster, <coughs> it's for me. Yeah, well, it's gotta <laughs> have a high ticket price, so. Is there any yeah. other questions? Well, thank you, Andrea, this was really wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, thank you.